Welcome back to the Res Developer Sessions. Um, we've still got some great stuff coming up today, actually. In an hour's time, we have Dean Hall, uh, developer of DayZ, which is my personal highlight of the show. No offence to our next speakers. Um, <laughs> speaking of whom, uh, this is Chris and Mark from Introversion. Hello, everyone. Is this coming through all right? That's like the best introduction I've had, right? Thanks for coming, but the next yeah. one's like loads better. No, it's not. <laughs> you came to the right one. I um, can't really see very well. How many people know introversion? OK, how many people know subversion? How many people know about prison architect? How many people know we cancelled subversion? Right, we're done, mate. We're done. <laughs> Bye. But they already know. That's the whole talk. Yeah, OK. So um, for those of you that don't, I'll just give you a very quick like, sort of history of the company where we came from. Um, I'm Mark Morris, I'm the Managing Director of Introversion, which is kind of a grandiose term that doesn't make any sense, because the only other person at Introversion is Chris, and I neither manage nor direct him as much as I try, <laughs> he refuses. So basically, Chris does everything about the games, so all the games come from Chris, he does all the design work, most of the programming, and then I do all of the business side of it. So I do, I have input on the games, but not a lot, he generally tells me to go fuck myself. <laughs> so. Um, Four games. So the first game uh, that we ever made was a game called Uplink, a hacking simulator. <laughs> <laughs> Just released it on the iPad. How many people bought it on the iPad? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how, many of you, how many of you have got iPads? I should have done it the other way around. OK. All right, the rest of you, get out. Um, yeah, so Chris, uh, Chris wrote Uplink when he was at university. We were at university together, another guy called Tom and another guy called um, Johnny. Chris was originally thinking about uh, releasing Uplink for free, just to give the world some love. And I came along and said, no, 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 no. And, um, and, and, and sold it. We still have lots of arguments, because I think at his, at his core, Chris wants to be poor. So, um, <laughs> so I try and help him. So, um, we made a bit of money with that link, it did quite well. Um, we won, well we didn't win, we entered an entrepreneur competition at Imperial where we were all studying at the time. And um, we didn't win the entrepreneurial competition, but we did go ahead and start a business anyway. We had to write a business plan for that. And I have no idea who did win and where they are, but you know, bollocks to them, <laughs> we're still here. Um, we made Uplink. Uh, Uplink sold uh, pretty well. We were pretty happy. There weren't really, there wasn't an indie scene back then. There weren't really micro studios, so we got a lot of love from from the press. People talking about the fact that kind of this small team of, of two, three, four guys had written a game and were selling it. Uh, we had some good retail exposure. We got um, fucked over by a publisher in the states, so we real games company. Um, Thought we made loads of money, hired speed cars and did all sorts of uh, speed cars, uh, fast cars and speed boats. Um, spent loads of money at E3 and then ran out of money, so um, that was cool. Because <laughs> now we could like talk about the roller coaster ride. And we made a game called Darwinia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. More, more Uplink fans, maybe. Yeah. More Uplink fans. Um, it made Darwinia in 2005. Um, Darwinia was, was quite, a, quite a sort of strange game, quite a difficult game to um, explain. But uh, we won the IGF uh, competition out in San Francisco with Darwinia, which was um, a wonderful moment for us. There was a really great kind of vindication of all the hard times that, that we'd gone through back then. Uh, after Darwinia, Chris decided that he had enough of kind of, you can see quite a long uh, sort of four year development time there. And uh, Chris wanted to do a game in a day originally, so he sort of did a prototype for Defcon in a day. Then he said it was going to take him a week, but actually he managed to deliver the whole thing in, in a year with, um, was Gary helping you yeah. with that, with, with one other programmer um, doing Defcon, so quite an achievement really. After Defcon came Multiwinia, um, probably not our most sort of successful game, but still a lot of fun and a game that I think more people should um, should play. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. Oh, thanks, mate. Talk about today. So. Um, Subversion. Subversion originally started out, you can see there, 2002, so this is just, just post-uplink. So um, Subversion really was a kind of game based around hacking real worlds, hacking buildings. So um, at this point, for those that know a bit about Subversion, there was no real procedural generation game on, there's no cities or anything like that. It was literally, rather than um, hacking within cyberspace, which is what uplink was all about, this was about whether you could do that within, within kind of buildings. And, Chris spent about two months on Subversion uh, right at the, at the back here, 2002, and then um, he saw this thing in the Indie Games Jam about putting loads of sprites on games, and he started working on that. We were getting a bit frustrated with him at this point, me and Tom, we were like, mate, you have to pick one project or the other, you can't kind of go with both. So Chris um, picked to work on what was then called Future, or would eventually become Darwinian. 
But Subversion kind of never really left Chris. You know, he, he always wanted to kind of return to this. It was sort of like, I described it as his, his, his kind of magnum opus. So even though DEF CON was going on, there was always a bit of, bit of work being done on, on Subversion. And in 2008, um, somehow Chris found like a, an academic paper that was talking about city generation and created um, the city gen tech that, you know, I think probably a lot of you are aware of. Basically, we automatically procedurally generate the city. And this was going to be the world in which Subversion the game was going to take place. So, still going on, 2008, I think we're probably doing Darwinia Plus at this point, which is Darwinia and Multiwinia for, um, on the 360, but Chris was still kind of gently plugging away. And then, 2010, this was kind of when, as a, as a company, we just released Darwinia Plus, which is not done uh, well enough at all on the 360. So, at that point, we were about eight, nine people, something like that. So, we had to get rid of the, all of those guys, and it was just back to myself and Chris, and so version was going to be the next game. And he was working on it. And I, I felt, as did Chris, that there, there, was, there was a lot of technology in Subversion, but not a huge amount of gameplay, really. There was nothing that was going on in that game was, um, was hugely kind of fun to play. And this was quite worrying, because not only was there nothing that was particularly good fun to play, there didn't really seem to be a clear idea of how we were going to get to something that was good to play. And at this point in 2010, you know, we're looking at the bank balance kind of going down again, and we know we needed to get something, uh, get something out there. Now, ultimately, as most of you are aware, Subversion got canned, and um, we moved on to a, a different game, Prison Architect, which I'm sure you know is on the, um, the show floor out there, so you can come and have a play if you haven't already. And basically, what we wanted to do today is just have a chat to you about how we, what happened with Subversion and how we moved it into the, um, into the kind of PA world. So I'm going to let Chris um, talk to you about that, and then we'll take any questions. Yeah, so the key issue, I guess, why we're here to talk today is this idea of what happened to Subversion. You know, it, it seemed to be a promising project, and, and then we suddenly switched to Prison Architect out of nowhere. Um, and the core of this issue is, like, how did we get from where we were after years of work on Subversion into a completely different game from a completely different idea? And that's really what I'm here to talk to you about. Now, a lot of people still sort of including me, still kind of really want Subversion to <laughs> become something or see something happen of it. But the truth of the matter, and you have to believe me on this, is it really did suck as a game. Right? <laughs> and once something sucks as a game, it's quite hard to work around that problem <laughs> as a game designer. You either need a tremendous amount of money to buy a lot of marketing exposure, or, um, or you need to <laughs> find alternative uh, line of work. Um, so what I think I'm actually going to do today is run Subversion. Uh, as, a, as a starting point, and go through some of the things that kind of should work but don't in this game. So I'm going to start by loading a level which is called Art Heist. And the idea behind this level, here we go, here's the Art Heist level. This whole place is like a giant um, art museum with various very, very expensive pieces of kit lying around. And at the very, very center of it, here we have our objective, which is the world's largest diamond. <laughs> and you can see it's protected by a whole kind of laser force field. Right? And every single one of these laser emitters is a genuine bit of kit, and it's all wired into junction boxes. And this stuff isn't faked. It's actually, um, the tech behind this is actually logical and makes sense. And the, the wiring diagrams and these laser emitters are actually sending signals and things. And as soon as you step inside one of the range of these laser emitters and the range suddenly shortens, it triggers the alarm. Um, now, if we zoom out and look around, you can also see that there's, there's a camera over here which is kind of surveying the area, recording any evidence of anything bad that might be happening. Um, and it's all wired in to, I mean, there's also there's a control room over here. This is kind of where the guards would hang out. They can see that they've got screens which don't actually display anything at the moment, but would ultimately have displayed what the cameras were showing. And behind the secure room, we've got a kind of whole server farm, right? This is the actual computer equipment. This is running the security in this building. So there's a stack of, these are camera control systems that are connected to all the CCTV on the level, and um, you know, it's all wired. It's all networked together. There's like an Ethernet router and everything like that. And you know, <laughs> and this is the uh, this is the laser alarm system here. So these the incoming wires that are coming up from the ground, those are the wires from the laser emitters in the in the room. And you can see that they're uh, and uh, all gated together into uh, into an alarm unit. And so this is the actual device 
that runs the security, right? Totally fucking brilliant, right? How cool is this shit? Right? And I actually really do like this sort of thing. I geek out over this kind of thing, and I really do... It does make me sad, like, playing through it, because there was so much sort of... I love the idea of having, like, this, this kit that you can play with and make all these really high-security places. Um, but there's just kind of like, well... There's a number of problems with this. I'll show you how you actually play the game. So if we actually put some of our guys into the building, here we go, here's a guy, Kieran. Right, a while ago I got bored of the fact that nobody uh, had any kind of character, so I started naming people. Um, and this guy, for some reason, is named Kieran. I think he's named after Kieran Gillen, actually, the journalist. <laughs> now, how would you actually defeat a level like this, right? Like, with, a, with a guard walking around, how are you gonna, how are you gonna steal this, uh, how are you going to steal the laser? How are you going to steal the diamond? How are you going to get for the lasers without setting off the alarm? How are you not going to run into the guard, etc.? Well, this is what most players do. Right? They go, mm, here's a guard. Oh, there he is. Right, I'm going to pause the game. Right, let's just get into a better place. Hello. I'm going to get out my AK-47. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to select the guy. And you can see already that actually the interface is really quite sucky. Right, it's very, it's over the top, right? So I'm just going to go, yeah, have some of this There we go. All right. So, all right. Months of work on AI routines <laughs> just got sacrificed, right? This guy could have been stood in this in this server room, right? And he could have seen you on the CCTV camera, radioed his mate over a working radio system which you could have intercepted and jammed, and told his mate to come and investigate the fact that you were stealing a diamond. Alternatively, you know, if you pull the cameras, for example, if you turn all the cameras off, he would have intelligently gone to investigate where the broken cameras were and, um, and gone to see what was going on, right? But, of course... Well, we just shot him in the head, so none of that really, <laughs> none of that really counts for much. And I think this is kind of the central problem, one of the central problems of the game, apart from the sort of suckiness of the game interface, is that all the system work that took absolutely months to develop, it's, um, it's, all, it's all very, very bypassable, it's all very shortcutable, and there's not really any good reason not to do it this way. So you could say, like, as a game designer, maybe we'll just, like, maybe we'll just take the guns out, right? Maybe we won't have any guns, and you can do that. Um, but ultimately, you're sort, of, you're sort of taking features away from the player in order to make your game not suck any longer. You know, so for the laser force bill, for example, we've got here a keypad lock, which actually, for debug reasons, has the code written on it. Um, but I, I can cheat, for example, or I can just type in the code. And you can see that the stuff that we're doing here, where you actually type in the code, it's quite nice and, I don't know, I have mixed opinions on it. It's kind of like, it's the sort of thing that you do as a game designer when you've got no sodding clue where your core gameplay is going to come from. Right, you just put every option that you can think of. So these alarm systems, for example, right, they're vastly over-engineered. Right? We can, I can actually cut any of the wires independently. Right? <laughs> you know, with a pair of wire cutters, I can chop out all the wires and it switches to fault mode. You know, or I can just use it and that switches it off. Right? And I'll do the same with the other one as well. There we go. Um, this kind of like verb system, pick up, use, inspect, is like a clear sign to me now that there was no, there was no clear idea of what the core game was going to be. And there you go, we've kind of turned off the lasers. So despite the fact that this may have taken like the small team of introversion, it kind of, you know, <laughs> months of work to build this level, the player has defeated it with a single gunshot to the head and then pressing a couple of on buttons. Um, and I'm going to pick up the diamond and make off with it. And that is that level defeated, and that is, in a nutshell, the core of the problem. It's this idea of, um, we hit upon starting using this phrase of, like, bang for buck, you know, which is that you can invest, oh, shit, you can invest um, hours and hours of time in systems that you think are going to give you loads and loads of immersion, I just cheated there, loads and loads of immersion possibilities for how the game might play out, like the fact that these laser systems, like, what if he's got, like, a mirror, and he uses a mirror to divert the lasers? Yeah, but maybe he'll just turn the system off, right? <laughs> because that's easier. And it might just take us, like, three months to build the mechanism that allows them to, to, to uh, you know, bend the lasers around the corner or something. And that's kind of the extent of that level. So already from playing this level, I kind of was already feeling that uh, this is not working and more to the point, we're spending months at a time building these levels and nothing's really coming of it. So one of the other levels that we have interestingly, and this you may see an interesting link approaching here, is a prison.
Right, now in this, this, the idea behind this is that there was going to be a story level, and one of these guys is like one of your team, right? and he's, he's living in a jail. Right? You can see that each cell's got like a little uh, blocky bed and a toilet, and you know there's a series of locks, and these locks are all electrical locks, and they're all wired to a control system in here, so you can mess with all of that stuff. Um, and you know, again, the same core form actually exists, which is that the easiest solution to this level is just two, it's just two locks in a row, right? And so I'm just going to drill them. Here we go. So by drilling out these two locks, I can just bypass anything that I put into this game. But it was still part of the plan that we were going to have a fully functioning prison in which one of your teammates was was um, imprisoned. And you were going to have to break him out by messing with the sort of routine of the prison. Um, and we didn't really have any conception in our own minds of how long it was going to take us to make a fully functioning prison level. We certainly thought it was likely to be a lot of work. Um, and so we started to try and look for things that we could do that would make it easier to do this. So if I switch this into, oop, if I switch this into editor mode, firstly, this is the tool that we actually use to build the levels in Subversion. You can see that it's giving us a sort of geometry layout of what everything looks like. Um, and it was actually pretty unwieldy because it was designed to do really oddly shaped uh, locations. Um, and so we designed this tool called the Geometry Brush, which was basically a fast grid editing system. Right, where we could kind of we could draw geometry really quickly, right? Like so, yeah. Yeah, like, kind of like this, and then you could double click, and it becomes actual geometry really, really fast. We can switch into 3D, and straight away we can fiddle with that geometry that we've just drawn. And by repeatedly doing that, we can build up a very complex level very quickly, a lot quicker than we would have been able to by doing it, you know, by hand or, or by uh, you know any other means like that. And this was kind of the beginning of the end for Subversion, actually, because as crude as it was in Subversion, I started to spend more and more time <laughs> in this prison building system <laughs> rather than making an actual functioning prison level. Because you can see that this isn't really a particularly expansive level. I didn't really know what the prisons were going to be like. But I did know that we were going to have to build a lot of geometry very, very quickly. And this was one of the ways that I was thinking that we were going to, we were going to do it. Um, the truth of the matter is that the game was kind of meant to make you feel like you were in Mission Impossible, you know? I don't mean like Tom Cruise. <laughs> I mean like the original 1970s TV series Mission Impossible, um, where you felt like you were like this incredibly high-tech hacker who was breaking through these complex buildings. And there's a combination of the fact that every system was massively over-engineered and the interface to the game was just dreadful. You never really felt like that. And I'd actually already had enough of subversion at this point. I was get really getting quite... Uh, I was getting quite worried because we'd been working on this for a long time and Mark was kind of saying, there's no gameplay, there's no gameplay. And for the first time ever, <laughs> for the first time ever, I was actually starting to agree quite violently that oh, there was tons and tons of technology behind this and it all looks nice, but there was no gameplay. And, you know, it's quite hard to get around that. You know, it's, it's pretty terminal, basically. So... You know, I mean, I could basically just summarize everything that I just said by just, <laughs> you know, subversion suck. I don't know, I mean, that's not, that's not very subtle. It didn't entirely suck. It's more like, you know, nice graphics. <laughs> Shame about the game. <laughs> that's probably closer to the reality. Um, now, we, I, I decided, we, we, I was going to go on holiday with my, with my wife, and she wanted to go to California. And um, I thought this would be a really good opportunity to, firstly, just to have a break and sort of clear my own head, basically. Because it wasn't working as a game, and I was hoping that I would go on holiday and I would have this, this burst of, of inspiration, which would fix everything that was broken about subversion. And it did, because it made me cancel the whole game. Right? <laughs> it was a very useful holiday. And the thing about California and uh, San Francisco in particular, where we went, is that there is, um, there is Alcatraz. And I decided to go to Alcatraz, actually partly out of research, because I knew there was going to be a prison level on this game. And I wanted to know what an actual prison was going to be like. And um, it's an incredibly atmospheric place. These are actual photos from, from when I was at Alcatraz. And you can see, actually, straight away, even from the, even from the boat, it kind of looks like a video game level, <laughs> with its multiple levels and wrecked buildings and the kind of water tower. And the engineer in me is already geeking out that the water tower is kind of over here, and it's higher than the rest of the building, and all the water pressure here, you know, <laughs> all this complex system stuff. 
And I, you know, I had quite serious Dwarf Fortress envy at this point, right? I'd, 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 spent, I'd, I'd done my 20 hours of time learning Dwarf Fortress, and now I was able to play it. And, and it's absolutely brilliant, and um, I love the way that they were... They were doing what I wanted to do in Subversion, which was simulate everything at the system level, right? So the player could mess with it. But rather than kind of like the, us, the game designers, having to design everything using that complex system, Dwarf Fortress had it all on its head. And, you know, the, the player was the person who was using all this complex tech. And so, you know, this is another shot from inside Alcatraz. So you can see like rows and rows of showers, and yes, there is soap. Everyone always has a thing about the soap in showers. I don't know what it is. And but, but actually, I'm actually looking at the piping, right? And I'm going, oh wow, you know, the piping, the last <laughs> water pressures and everything. I'm thinking about the mechanics behind this place, and I'm sort of partly thinking about, um, you know, how we're going to how we're going to get this to work in a subversion level, and partly not. And this is what the cells look like in Alcatraz. It's really interesting that it's a really quite a grim place, but very, very atmospheric. And, um, and you can still see, actually, there's bullet, ho there's bullet holes in the place, and there's like grenade explosions on the walls where the US Army had to retake Alcatraz at one point after a riot. It's a very atmospheric place to go. There's me doing the, <laughs> doing the tourist thing. Kind of, that's, that's the isolation cell. And, um, and we had this guy there who was uh, demonstrating how the doors worked, and he was talking about how there's like no, there's no electronics at this point when Alcatraz was built. There's no digital electronics or anything, so the entire door mechanism is a, is a mechanical system, and you have to crank these enormous, like these enormous, uh, you know, levers that, that actually physically move every door, and you can you can dial in which door you want to be opened, and then you can pull a lever, and the door opens, and it's all mechanical. It's all from it's all running down these sort of. Uh, these mechanical trunk lines above the door. And again, you know, the geeky engineer in me is just going, that's so cool, man. I want to have that in Subversion. I want to let the player drill through one of these in Subversion and let him, you know, mess with the fact that the door isn't going to open properly. Um, but the truth of the matter is that, yeah, yes. The truth of the matter is that the, what was actually happening to me, by the time I'd, by the time we'd left Alcatraz and we were on the boat back, I'd actually already had another game idea, and the game idea was Prism Architect. And what I was basically thinking um, as a result of this was that I was going to take a hybrid of, um, of uh, the idea that, you, that there's a prison level in, in Subversion where you had to bust somebody out, and there was this editing mode that I'd already found was quite good fun to play with. And there was this Dwarf Fortress, I was total Dwarf Fortress envy about how they had all this complex system, but the, the, the game designer himself never had to make it himself. The, the players were responsible. And kind of mixing it all together into this new game called Prison Architect. And that is the gestation of where the game came from. And it was a really simple idea that you would start with a totally blank world, and that you would draw the walls and rooms, and that workmen would come along and would build the place for you. And I really wanted to have have that feeling that you were engineering a really complex system that would start out as just a building with some doors, and then prisoners would arrive and make things much harder for you because they're going to try and circumvent everything in your prison. You know, I love this idea that there's no enemy army in Prison Architect. You know, the enemy army is is inside your base, and they're there permanently, and you're not allowed to kill them all because they're prisoners, right? You actually have to look after them, even though they want to escape, or they want to wreck the place, or they want to do nothing. They've got this wonderful mix of, um, you know, the sort of bullfrog management game that, that really should not have, that really died way before its time, and people stopped making those kinds of games. And mixing that with that kind of hardcore element of Dwarf Fortress, where the systems are simulated to a, a much heavier level. And I thought that this was absolutely brilliant uh, mix for a game. And I, I told my wife about it, and she's just like, oh, no. Oh, no. No. And I was saying, what if we just like switch projects? You know, I, What if I just scrap years of work <laughs> and switch projects? It's just, no. Don't do it. Don't do it. And actually, you know, I just did it. And <laughs> it had to be done. It was a much better idea, and, um, and it was the right decision. And, and so for the flight home, I... Um, I bought this notebook and just started writing down the ideas for Prison Architect in a notebook on the flight. It was like a 10-hour flight, and I spent basically eight hours writing down everything that I thought of in this notebook, and then the remaining two hours consuming a bottle of wine. It was one of the best flights I've ever been on. It just flew by, right? It was absolutely brilliant. And, and by the end of it, the design for Prison Architect was kind of sorted. And this is actually a sketch from page three of that um, design book. And you can see that actually already this sketch has most of the elements that are in the game that you can play 
play now in the booth. It's got the pipes that I was geeking out so much on, the sort of big fat piping in the water, then the thinner pipes connecting to each toilet, and it's got the grid-based layout, and the prisoners are here, and the guards, right? The guards that I'd written all this AI code for in Subversion. So they'd patrol backwards and forwards, and they would investigate suspicious behavior, and they would kind of stop and have cigarettes. And it was all defeated by a single bullet to the brain. And, you know, in, in prison architecture, it was not likely to be like that, and that AI was actually going to get some use. And, you know, I knew that it would, I knew that it would work well um, when it was all put together. Um, so I also knew that there was something slightly worrying, which was that I'd been telling Mark and Tom for two years that I was working on the greatest game ever, right? <laughs> called Subversion. And the world. And the world, yeah, Mark rightly points out. And um, I was going to have to break it to Mark that, that, well, there's good news and there's bad news, really. <laughs> the good news is I've had a really good game idea, right? <laughs> the bad news is, you know, we're going to we're gonna have to ditch Subversion. And, I actually made a presentation about it. I actually made a PowerPoint presentation, even though we're just two mates who went to university <laughs> together. Right? I had slides, and uh, you know, I thought it through, and I thought through the business case for it and the creative case for it, and. Um, and I took Mark to a coffee shop and just basically explained it to him. And I genuinely thought that it was 50-50 about whether Introversion would close at that coffee shop. Because I thought there was a good chance, actually, Mark would have been well within his rights to just say, you know, stop this. <laughs> it's just another idea, you know, how do we actually know it's going to, how do we actually know it's going to turn out to be anything, you know? But actually, I think that the general response that I got from Mark was that he was so bloody well relieved that I actually had a game to show him. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, and so we had the we had the go ahead to start work on on a prison architect prototype, which was supposed to be a month or so of rapid prototype development to see if this game idea was a good one. But internally for me, I'd already made up my mind that I was definitely going to do it. It was more a matter of just convincing ourselves that it was going to be feasible. Um, and this is actually uh, the first ever screenshot of Prison Architect. Isn't it amazing? Right. You know, you can, you can click and draw, and that's kind of the extent of it. But actually, pretty rapidly, within a week or so, I had guys running around sort of doing the building for you, and we had the distinction between a wall and a floor, and we had workmen kind of pathfinding around and gathering materials and building stuff. Very dwarf fortress, all of it. Um, Again, this is, this is about week two. You can start to see that some objects have appeared, jail doors and beds and things. And the general feeling of building a place was already, in, was already working. And you can see there's already a toolbar at the bottom, which is kind of exactly the same toolbar as we have in the finished game right now. Um, again, this is like week three. Now we've got storerooms in the top right corner where the workmen will store all the raw materials when they're not being used. Um, and we've got, uh, the, the guys are just kind of wandering around, but you can already feel like there's something here. And, and actually, within, within the first month, the game was already significantly more playable than Subversion ever was. Um, Subversion was always kind of, you know, loads of great tech, but, you know, nothing to the game. Whereas this was kind of hardly any tech, but the game is already working, right? The core, there's already a core game in this tech demo after just three weeks, which Subversion searched for for maybe two years and still never found its core game. Um, and then for a while, we switched to Alien Breed graphics, and everything just looks completely shit <laughs> for ages. I just found an Alien Breed sprite bank on Google and uh, just, just thought, yeah, man, we'll make it look like Alien Breed. And, it, <laughs> and, and it, it started to look like some sort of sci-fi hellhole, like a bad level from Alien Breed, basically. This is a riot. Can't you tell? <laughs> this is what a riot actually looked like. Um, and so we actually did have a breakthrough moment when we figured out that we needed to actually bring in some, some art talent, <laughs> an actual artist who could do real graphics. And we knew that because prisons, you know, it's a difficult topic, a prison, and um, it was going to have to be... In Subversion, we just do everything abstract, right? It's like blank faces and it's outlines, and we knew that we were going to have to have humans and people in our prisons. Otherwise, it was just going to feel awful. And so we hired this artist who called Ryan Sumo, who did all the art for Space Chem. And I played and loved Space Chem and loved the artwork in it as well. And I really thought that he would be absolutely perfect for it because he had this wonderful, crisp art style. And um, but incredibly fortuitously, he's also a very talented sort of sketch artist. And um, 
I think it was, it was kind of his idea to start using kind of Polaroids and sketches to highlight things that are happening. So you've got this kind of juxtaposition of Ryan's sort of quite cutesy um, graphics occurring in the game view, where everything's sort of top down and simple. And you've got the mixture of these slightly harder uh, character graphics kind of bringing it to life and giving you something to look at. And they were a little bit of a revelation, and they definitely brought the game to life and really gave us our idea of how we we're going to weave a story through Prison Architect. Because every film that you've ever watched about prisons is, is actually about prisoners, typically. The prisoners are normally the main characters because they're just really fascinating people. And they're from a very different walk of life, typically, to what you would normally run into. Um, and exploring that in a game has is, is definitely given a lot of, a lot of material for, for us to work with. Um, OK, so that's all done. So I guess I should probably, um, yeah, Mark was telling me earlier, make sure you run Prison Architect, right? <laughs> so I guess I better make sure I actually do run Prison Architect uh, whilst I'm here. So the, when you, once you put all that together, that's actually quite a while ago. So we're talking 2010 now when I actually, August 2010, when I actually held that meeting where it's kind of like the company was either going to explode right there or, um, or we were going to switch course quite significantly. And so we're talking a couple of years ago now, and this is where we are today. This is all play now on the show for if you haven't had to a chance to play it. Um, and you can kind of see from the... Uh, ooh, that's quite loud. You can kind of see from the, from the way the game works already that what you do in this game is exactly what was happening in that subversion map editor. Right? It's the same basic mechanism. The toolbar's on the left side instead of the right side, but other than that, the, the mechanism for drawing locations is exactly the same. Um, the workman building it up for you is because I always kind of love looking at, you know, intricate things in progress. You know, I love seeing, like, systems in progress that you haven't directly done. Um, and this mechanism for laying out the game was in place, you know, within that, within that first month prototype um, and fully working. And you can, even just laying out a basic cell is already quite satisfying and, and fun to mess with. Um, and... You can kind of see the gestation in it, in, in all the things that came before, leading up to this. Uh, if you do that for long enough, you end up with kind of a full prison, which can kind of look like this. And this, is, this has got kind of everything going on, right? There's a common room with TV and some pool tables, and uh, there's, you know, there's workout benches, you know, and uh, you know, there's telephones, and all the prisoners have got this kind of, all that, AI, all that AI tech that we developed for subversion that just got, was for nothing, that just basically had no purpose, kind of found its way into, into prison architect, because the, the civilians in subversion were kind of, they were like people that were in a bank, for example, they would respond to you doing various things. And um, they would, you know, they would, they would use cash machines and they would withdraw money from the bank. But if you pulled a gun out, they would respond in an intelligent way. And a lot of that stuff found its way. Oh, quite. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but see, that, I wanted stuff like that to happen, right? This is kind of like there's a slight, there's a slight bug in this version. I think that's actually far more likely to happen than it should. Be. Oh bloody hell, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Well, you know, we do have we do have a medical ward, so it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and so this is like the combination. After two years of work, you can see that Ryan's artwork is here and has and has totally it's kind of brought the characters to life. And yes, it was Ryan that put the little pixelated bone cracks in them when they're in the shower and stuff. Little touches like that. I don't actually tell him to do that. He just does it. And then you know sometimes he sneaks things in. But you can see guys. You know they'll make use of all the facilities in the prison. They'll phone home. Um, you know if they're getting lonely and stuff like that, they'll make a call home. And they'll work out in the exercise yard if they uh, if they're feeling like they need to be doing that. It's kind of like a sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs running, in, running inside each prisoner. And um, it's very much, it's kind of the same system that was used in The Sims, in that each character's got this hierarchy of needs. So they'll deal with like the base needs first, like sleep and food and you know, using the toilet and stuff. And once that's kind of taken care of, they'll kind of go up the hierarchy and start thinking about the next level of needs, which is like boredom and uh, you know, friendship and uh, things like that. And you know, at the very top level, you've got all the really nice sort of high end, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a 
working school at this prison kind of kind of things. And it, it, won't, it won't work at all if none of the needs at the lower levels have been dealt with. But unlike in The Sims, where you've only got three or four, or two or three even people within a house, you're dealing with a prison where you've got, you know, like a hundred people, all of whom have got a slightly different set of needs that need to be dealt with. And so you kind of have to make the decision of how you're going to use your limited resources. So you, you're kind of making decisions of like, well, a lot of people in the prison are pretty bored all the time. So maybe we'll build a lot of tape, a lot of televisions, or you know, a common room or something, because that'll kind of deal with the largest number of people at once. Um, you know, and you deal with it on. That level rather than on the individual level. So I think that is pretty much the end of my demo. Um, yeah, I think I'll hand it back to Mark. Thanks, mate. Thanks, everyone. Am I working? Um, yeah, so I think we've just got as much time as we want for any questions we might have. There's a microphone, I think, going around, so. Stick your hand up, you'll get a microphone, shout a question at us, we'll lie. Hi, sorry. Um, no, right, you need to wait as well. Right. Okay, sorry, right yeah. here. Um, quick question. It's one of the criticisms I've heard, which I thought was interesting, is that it's quite a sensitive topic, especially mm. in some places. Like, somebody in Rock Paper Shotgun came into that in the US. This is a huge, massive complex where one in ten people is imprisoned, and, you know, it, people made loads of money off it. So, in a way, you're dealing in a sensitive, with a very sensitive topic in a way that looks quite cartoony and not mm. serious. So how are you trying to deal with that? Are you just avoiding the political aspect entirely, or are you, I mean, what are you, how are you doing That's a good question. Um, we, no, we're not. I mean, we were quite surprised by some of the comment threads that, that popped up. We didn't realise it was going to be quite as controversial as, as it kind of turned out to be. So it was, it was very good for us that we kind of got given that wake-up call quite early on. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <'cause laughs> it's nothing, sorry, nothing to see. <laughs> I think it's fine. So, um, very, very serious, serious. We're taking it very seriously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we found ourselves um, consultants on, on both sides of the fence, or sides of the wall, if you like, that we're talking to, to try and give us a, a real understanding of um, what things are like in prison, because obviously there's a lot of fiction about it, but, you know, neither of us have been locked up, not that I'm aware of, maybe not, no, no, so we don't, you know, so we're trying to, we're trying to get a, a feel for it, mm -hmm. and also we're, we're just trying to, um, the US view on prisons, I think, is very different to the UK view, and as British developers, we need to be, uh, to get a good understanding of what the sensitivities are over there, I mean, the big, the big real problem for us, um, or big issue, I guess, is, is race, you know, and one of the things that I still don't think we've got any um, kind of black guards no, we do, in, yeah. uh, have we now? Our guards, no. No, guards, they're no, really, the guards are all white. white guards, right, which we don't, well. we don't think about that, you know, we just <laughs> didn't think about it for a second, well, and then yeah, of course we're, we're like, oh, you dickhead, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so all of these things that we haven't, you know, we've still got time before we're kind of going on um, formal, you know, release, so we're going to, we are going to deal with those, and we haven't, we don't know yet kind of how far we're going to push it, but both Chris and I want to explore these issues, not kind of shy away Definitely, from yeah. them. You know? well, the thing as well is that there is a mixture. There is, there is kind of an open sandbox mode where you can, you know, we're hoping that you can kind of build any kind of prison that you want, and it's sort of up to you what kind of prison you end up with. But at the same time, we also have a series of story levels, starting with the first level, which is kind of a tutorial. And then as each level progresses, we actually are bringing out characters and, and dealing with issues in a, in a kind of scripted way. Um, and I think that's part of how we're dealing with it as well, because when you're dealing with this many prisoners, it is quite difficult to think about any one individual. Um, but it is, you know, we did knowingly pick a topic that we knew would have some, you know, really, really rich possibilities for dealing with um, complex stuff. But, you know, if, you, if an American team made the game, you'd end up with a very different game, I think. Yeah. They'd all be being gassed. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Prison architect, just to make an announcement to the press so they don't print that last quote, um, <laughs> <laughs> will be going into paid alpha this year. We're, we're like pledging to do that now, so if there are any press here, which I'm sure there are, obviously, um, you can write that. Don't write what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Where are you? Over there. Okay, yeah. The um, Subversion City Generation procedural city generation technology looked really cool. Are you thinking of using that again or hoping to? Uh, yeah, well, um, we're not we're not thinking about doing any more development on it, but um, we we don't want subversion to die. So we are trying to figure out the right way to um, 
for its life to be continued. So without sort of saying too much about it, um, I think there might be some things happening with Subversion mm. over the next kind of few months. And I didn't even mention the procedural generation that was going on in Subversion in the past. But I mean, all the problems that I highlighted in the game right there, but they were dealing with levels that had been handmade. And when you multiply that up by the fact that the entire level might actually be procedurally generated, it kind of made everything even more impossible. Like this idea that it was kind of months of work just to get a door that you could drill open with, you know, it's even worse when you consider the original design was that we were going to procedurally generate the entire city and then have um, you know each building that you could go in and it was ridiculously overambitious um, and I think it was in hindsight a mistake to go for that tech before we had the core game sorted actually. Next one. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know a bit about the sort of music and sound design because that was one of the things that I really noticed when playing the Prison Architect demo outside. Mm. That it was sort of very dark. We've got a very, very talented audio engineer called Alistair Lindsay, and um, I used to work with him um, back in 2001. And he's done the sound for every one of our games except for Uplink. He didn't work for us then, but he did. He did the sound of all the Darwinians. He, did, he recorded the sort of cats mewling and stuff and made that into the Darwinians. And he did all the music for Defcon as well. So all that kind of real ambience of the world being nuked into oblivion is all his doing. And he and I see alike, I think, in that we like our dark themes. <laughs> and he's very, very talented. And um, in this particular game, he spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, you, a lesser sound designer would kind of just do like, what's the sound of a prisoner's face banging against a wall? <laughs> I'll still kind of think about, you know, how do we want the player to feel while this is happening? And it will kind of blend that in right, through the medium of like recording, I don't know, whales or something. <laughs> and it will blend that into the soundtrack. So things that happen in the game, for example, is the toolbars have all got like a subtle tick on them, a little click, right? And, um, which is always there. And there's always a click when you click on it. And it's very satisfying, clean, sharp sound because you want the user interface to be like that but when the prison is kind of gone wrong and there's been a big fight or the atmosphere is very bad that tick sound is replaced with something much more torturous and it's like the sound of ruffled paper being flown all over the place and the sounds of the uh, that sort of tick sound of the menus popping up is replaced with the sound of like a jail door slamming shut incredibly hard and it's done quite subtly even though I just described it to you in kind of like the, the obvious way it's totally cross faded so you never quite feel it. But if you're playing a level which has gone totally wrong and the atmosphere is terrible, all of the interface components even change their sounds just to make you feel slightly different whilst you're playing the game. He's a real genius. Yeah, Al's um, giving a talk actually about the audio in PA at Develop next week if, if anyone's like there for that. And um, he's sort of trying to launch a, a freelance career at the moment, so he's kind of for hire. So I'm sure he won't mind if any of you are interested in using him for your own games to, uh, I don't know, probably get in contact with us. Um, and we'll get, get a hold of Alfie. OK, next question. I always got a mic, yeah. <coughs> oh, over there. Okay, um, yeah. yeah, one of the things uh, I notice uh, about um, Prison Architect is that well, introversion games have always had a very distinctive uh, aesthetic. And Prison Architect d doesn't look like an introversion game. So when you decided to abandon subversion, was that the moment you decided that you needed a, com a completely different look as well? Um, not entirely, no. I, I did actually originally think that you could also do the prison game with the same kind of abstract um, display where it was all just... You could see that from the first screenshots that it, people were just green circles. Um, but it was impossible to kind of... The problem is it's, it's too much of a, there's too much of a human issue involved in, in jails to deal with it in such an abstract way. Um, and believe it or not, I actually wanted a break <laughs> from the blue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. yeah. Some people have said that uh, the Intrusion's successful games are the blue ones. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's not true of Subversion anymore, I suppose. <laughs> but I just wanted to change from that, actually. And I think that that blue look, I was actually, I was actually quite bored of Subversion's look by the end. You know? I look back on it now, and I actually quite like the look of it. But, but I have to keep reminding myself, no, it doesn't play. That There is no solution. <laughs> yeah. Two yeah, more okay, questions. Two more, so, apparently. All your games sort of have a theme of power and responsibility. Is it a deliberate thing? And if so, are you ever likely to do a game which approaches it in a completely different way? <sighs> do they? It's 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 like, like, <laughs> yeah, do, do they? Well, subversion, you can mess with other people's lives yeah. through hack. Not subversion, uplink. Yeah. Darwinia, you're controlling all these small, well, people. Yeah. And 
uh, they're con. Yeah. Why not the world? Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting like, theme that runs through uh, Chris's games. But I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he is a power-hungry lunatic. <laughs> so I expect the next game will be equally, you know, like power-hungry and just kind of crazy and weird. It's not, that's not something that we've like, ever kind of consciously been, been aware of. So Chris and I will probably be, now we know what we'll be talking about for five hours over dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah. One more, I think. Hi. Uh, where are you? You need to wave. Right, right at the back. There we go, yeah. I know. You say uh, Dwarf Fortress is a huge uh, inspiration for this game. And part of Dwarf Fortress is the nobles. Is there going to be that sort of uh, aspect of it? Special prisoners who are incredibly annoying to deal with? Yes. There are the administrators. <laughs> right. There's two sides to it. There's a bunch of administrators that you can hire. In fact, some of them are actually working here. We've got the foreman and the chief and the warden. And they all kind of, they all have slightly different responsibilities in the prison. You don't have to have them all, but as you hire them, they kind of open up new features for your prison. Um, and they're kind of related to um, a kind of a tech tree that runs through as well. So when you start out, you don't have access to so kind of like the most hardcore, you know, like guard towers and stuff. You kind of have to go down one route of bureaucracy before you're able to get access to that. And for the people that have played the first level and they know that it has like a sort of death row thing going on, that's not something that's immediately available either. It is kind of unlocked through administrators. Um, now, I call them administrators, but some of them are actually uh, prisoners as well because there's always the idea, I love the idea of the kind of old-timer prisoner who's kind of been in, his, been in prison forever and he's completely trusted by the guards and all the prisoners, so he's able to kind of give the, the prison staff an inside view on what's going on at the jail without being killed immediately afterwards, which anybody younger would have had. And he normally wears a hat and has grey hair and stuff, so I'll have to get writing on that <laughs> to, to do with some art. But I love the idea of some of your administrators actually being prisoners. Um, but yeah, the administrators and the bureaucracy in this are direct, their direct inspiration from Draw Fortress's um, nobles. Okay, cool. I think that's about all the time we've got. Um, we're going to try and watch the next, uh, next talk, but we're Prison Architects out on the show floor, and we'll be there from about three, so if you want to come and have a chat with us, then, you know, please do. We'd love to. I'd love to see you all. So thanks a lot.